Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. the book of Colossians, and we just started last Sunday, and last Sunday was sort of the opening of the book, the introduction, if you will, the first couple of verses. Uh, He greets the people, then verse 3 through 8, he actually um, is telling telling them how he thanks God for them, and then verses 9 through 14, he's actually praying for them. And now we're at verse 15, and and then it sort of gets into the heart of the letter. And actually, what it brings up in this section of Colossians involves the most important question that you'll ever answer. And he's dealing with the question of, who is Jesus? A hundred years from now, the the most important question that you'll have ever had on earth was this question, who is Jesus? And of course, people answer this question different ways, right? We know that. Different religions, you know, say different things, like the Muslims would say that Jesus is a prophet, but Muhammad's a greater prophet. And, uh, and then what we call cults who have the wrong view of Jesus would, it would answer this in different ways. For example, Mormons would say that Jesus resulted from a physical union between the father and a human being named Mary and, uh, and that resulted in Jesus. And then they would say that Jesus is only God in the sense that you and I can become God's one day. And then another cult, the Jehovah Witnesses. You know, they would say that Jesus is the first created of the Father. And originally, Jesus was Michael the Archangel. And so people have all these different views. And, and it's not just religions. It's even our culture. Our culture would typically say something of, which our culture still has retained a high view of Jesus in his humanity, they would say, well, Jesus is is a great teacher. But then most of those people would probably choke a little bit to say Jesus was God in the flesh on earth. And so who is Jesus is a hugely important question. And this is the exact question that the Christians in Colossae in the first century were struggling with because false teachers had come into the church and they were teaching that Jesus is somehow less than God. And so now Paul, in this section of his letter, he's writing to them and he's basically going to teach them, assure them that number one, Jesus is God. And number two, Jesus is creator. 
And then he's gonna list how Jesus is creator in that he created the universe, he created the church, and he created the only way to be reconciled to him. But we're gonna start with Jesus is God. Colossians 1, 15. We left off in 14, so here's verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. We'll stop right there. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, this can be a little confusing to some because we know from scripture that back in Genesis that we were created in God's image. And, and we are, in a sense, in the sense of uh, when we're created in God's image, it's the sense of that we have free will, we have choice, we can think rationally, we can be self-aware, we can have relationships. You know, in that sense, we are made in the image of God. Of course, the image of God we were made in was marred uh, when sin came into the world. So he's not talking about that type of image of God, not image of God like we were made. Uh, and by the way, the fact is that we are made in the image of God, that actually changes some things for us. For example, that's why Christians historically have looked down on slavery, for example, because Christians have always acknowledged that God made all people in his image. It's why Christians you know, aren't big on abortion because all people are made in God's image. It's why Christians put human life over animal life. Not that animal life's not important at all, but it's nothing compared to human life because human life is made in God's image. So all that flows out of that in Genesis. But Paul's talking about something way more, way beyond just in, in the way we're created in the image of God. And he's telling us that Jesus is the image of God in that he is the exact representation of God in whom all the fullness of God dwells. And we'll get to that in a few moments. That's what Paul is teaching right here. And then it continues, the firstborn of all creation. Now, if you'll notice, there's a bit of a problem that some people will notice in this, this one verse. For he is the image of God, the invisible God, that's saying he's God, but then he's the firstborn of all creation. Well, firstborn makes it sound like that Jesus came sometime after God and he was the first created. And so we know through scripture, all through scripture, Old and New Testament, that this term for firstborn can be taken in two different ways. One way is it's taken firstborn chronologically or firstborn in order, and that's the way we normally think about it. But there's another meaning of firstborn that's present in the Old Testament and the New Testament repeatedly that talks about firstborn in rank, firstborn in importance, firstborn in preeminence. And that's the sense here, what's going on, the firstborn of creation. So some people like Colts will try to say, well, he's saying he's just the firstborn of creation. That would actually undo everything that Paul is saying to refute the issue that Jesus is somehow less than God. It's the opposite of what, Christ, what Paul's saying about Christ. Paul's saying Jesus is God and he's firstborn in the sense of preeminent, rank, quality. And so we, we remember as we're figuring stuff like that out is that the first rule in Bible interpretation is that scripture first interprets scripture. We start with how scripture interprets scripture and then we go from there. And what the Bible's teaching us is that is a concept called the Trinity. Now the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but is, the word Trinity is a word we use to describe the concept of who God is from the Old Testament to the New Testament that's described for us in scripture. And so we can, we can try to illustrate the Trinity. It's difficult because nothing actually quite fits. But here's what the Trinity means, that God exists eternally as one God in three persons. So here's what that means. The Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So God exists eternally in three persons at the same time. And so 
for, and if you're kind of having a hard time, well, boy, that's, not, that's, that's kind of tough to understand. Yeah, well, we would expect it to be because we're finite humans trying to understand the nature of an infinite God. So that's gonna be difficult for us. You know, that's like an ant trying to figure out us. You know, that's gonna be difficult for us to do. And, but what, what scripture's teaching us, and this is what Paul's alluding to here, is that Jesus is equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, we have a bunch of illustrations that we use to try to illustrate this, but the, none of them are really so great. I mean, we use the egg, you know, one egg, but the egg has a shell and a white and a yolk. But the problem with that is the shell is part of the egg, the white's part of the egg, the yolk's part of the egg. Jesus is not part of God and Father part of God and the Holy Spirit. Called. Jesus is completely God. The Father is completely God. So then we use a, maybe a better illustration that water exists in three forms, solid, ice, or liquid, or vapor in steam, for example. But again, that's still not exactly right because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're not forms of God. Each is God. So these illustrations, I'm not saying they're bad, and they can help some, but they're not fully accurate. We don't really have an accurate way to describe this uh, as an illustration. So what Paul's talking about is that not only is Jesus God, now he's going to further describe Jesus as God to tell us that Jesus is also creator. And he first talks about that in that Jesus created the universe. We see that in verse 16. It says this, for by him, this is Jesus, for by Jesus or him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So this all things, visible and invisible. So first of all, the things that have been created by Jesus in the universe, everything that we see, is the primary evidence for God. This is evidence for God, evidence for God, evidence for God. And then people will say, well, science says this and this and this. Science cannot explain away this plain evidence of God in order to even get there. And by the way, science came out of Christianity, but that's a whole nother story. But either way you slice it, as we look at this, the visible world we see, life, creation, order, is all evidence for God, what Jesus created. And the only way you can get there to say science disproves that is you need to start with the premise that, okay, everything we say, it can't be God. And so if it can't be God, what's our best explanation? But if we open our minds up a little further and say, maybe it could be God or maybe not, now what's the best explanation? Hands down, the best explanation is God created and God created through Jesus Christ, both visible and invisible. And when he's talking about invisible, he's talking about the supernatural world, angels, fallen angels, you know, all that created by God, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, through him and for him. This little phrase at the end of this actually answers two of the biggest existential questions that humanity has. Existential questions are just questions about our existence. God has given us the ability to think so we can think, we can be self-aware and think, hey, why am I here? What do I exist for? This answers that. We are created through Christ. God created us through Christ. So where did I come from? That's the question of origin. One of the main existential questions. Where do I come from? This answers it. We come from God. We have been created by God. All people created by God. And then after knowing that, hey, where do I come from? The next question is, well, why am I here? This answers that. This la For him. We are here to serve God and enjoy him forever. That's our purpose. 
That's why he created us. We've been created for connection with God. And now here's another thing. Last Sunday, I was talking a little bit about the emptiness people feel in our culture, the hollowness, the soullessness. Well, here's part of the reason why. Jesus, God created us through Jesus or through the agent Jesus, however you want to say that. We've been created by Jesus and we were created for relationship with God. Some people will say things like we have a God-shaped hole in our soul. Well, that works. We're created to have a relationship with God. When we don't have that relationship with God, there's a void. And then we look around our world today and we see all these people trying to fill that void in their life, that void in their heart, actually that void in their soul with all these things. They just chase and chase and chase and they obtain all these things that they think will bring satisfaction and they never do. Just ask people who have attained all the things that you think will bring you satisfaction. It doesn't satisfy. Why? Because God has created us for a relationship with him and only that relationship will ultimately satisfy the longing of our soul. That's it. All right, so not only Jesus created the universe, but he says, uh, says this in verse 17, next verse. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Before all things. Jesus is before all things. Again, we're not talking order, we're talking preeminence. Because when it comes to creation, what does Genesis 1-1 said? What, what does Genesis 1-1 say? You know, God was there, right? Genesis 1-1 is telling us, hey, God, in the beginning... I said, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. God. He was there already. He existed eternally. Through him, creation happened. Before everything existed, God existed. And then it says, all, and in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. This is Jesus's present activity of sustaining all of creation, holding it together. He actively, knowingly, purposely, now, holds the universe together. Even people who don't believe in him, even critics of Jesus and of Jesus' church, Jesus holds them together and makes it possible through his graciousness that they can even take their next breath. Jesus holds all things together. And that's, I think when we reflect on this a little more, it gives us a better sort of perspective on life. I mean, think about it. A lot of times we see world events, we watch the news or we get you know, our feeds and we're checking things out. And sometimes things agitate us. You know, why is this happening? Why is that happening? You know, this is going on or politics, you know, that ticks us off. By the way, politics are never gonna solve all our problems. I mean, we can do better, I'm not saying that, but politics will never ultimately solve our problems. God will. And so we get all worked up. But look at it this way. Here's what Paul's telling us. All things have been created by God. The, the universe belongs to Jesus. He's got the title deed to the earth. And he created us. And, then on, and not only that, he's told us how it's all going to end. And it's going to be good for us when it ends, if we're his followers. And so now, if we keep this perspective that ultimately God is in control, and we know how it ends, then no matter what we see happening in the world, wars, this, that, politics, whatever it is, whatever we see, we can look at that knowing and here should be our view. Wow, this is interesting. This doesn't upset me because I know how it all ends. And I know I, that God will never leave me or forsake me. But then all of a sudden everything becomes interesting because you're wondering, wow, how is God going to use this event to bring about what he's promised to bring about? And then things, rather than irritating they become more interesting, like, wow, how's this gonna play out? Wow, how is this folding in? 
to God's continuing drama of redeeming the world. How's this going to happen? It changes our perspective. Jesus created the universe. He holds it together. But just as Jesus created the cosmos, Jesus also created the church. Here's verse 18. It says, he, meaning Christ, Jesus, he is also the head of the body, the church. And, and we'll just stop there for a minute. When he says head of the church, in scripture, there's two things that is referred to as a church. One is church universal, meaning all saved people, all redeemed mankind as part of the church. Past, present, and future, but, or you could just, present would be, Everybody who's truly a Christian is part of the big C church. But all through scripture in the New Testament is also church small C, which is talking about the local bodies of believers, how that big church is divided into small local churches that get together, that are commanded to get together in scripture. Jesus made the church where we come together and we praise and we teach and learn about God and where we encourage each other. So that's church, God's church. And he's the head of that. So well, what does that mean practically if he's the head of grace? Well, practically that means that we don't get to make church whatever we wanna make church. We teach at church what God has told us and nothing else. Because this is what happens all the time in our culture. Actually, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, there were shifts in our country that we would recognize that caused a whole bunch of churches who before that had stood on God's word to abandon God's word and go with a different approach to everything based on where our culture drifted to. And that is wrong. Christ is the head of the church. John 1 says Jesus is the word. It's the word that we've got to stick to. So here at Grace, what does that mean? For 83 years since our church has been here, we teach the exact same thing that we always have from the Bible. Our teachings, our beliefs have not shifted at all. 83 years, the word. But a bunch of churches have left that they start, first of all, not wanting to call, because of our culture, not wanting to call sin, sin. Well, then all of a sudden, if there's no sin, then you've emasculated the gospel that doesn't mean anything anymore. And now you don't have church because there's no gospel. That happens all the time. We see it in our town where that's happened over and over and over again. Jesus is the supreme head of the church and he's the head of our church. And that's why we stick with his word because we're not smarter than God. We don't grow or evolve to be smarter than our creator. It doesn't happen. Here's the other thing I noticed for me. Um, you know, I love grace. I love you. And God has given me the privilege of, of being a leader here at grace. It's huge for me. Love it. I also love my home church, Park Hill Baptist, Pueblo, Colorado. And I remember before I ever, ever even thought, I was the last guy that you would think would ever become a pastor. I don't even know how to say that. Just, you know, wasn't on my radar. It's just the last guy that thought he had ever become a pastor was me. But I loved my church. Park Hill Baptist, I love that church. I love the people. I didn't even know all the people. All that I loved them. They were my brothers and sisters in Christ. We were learning about God together. God put us together to encourage each other, help each other, protect each other, grow together. I loved our church. What surprised me in decades of ministry over the years is how many people are, are quick to criticize their church. It just sounds weird to me. Now, I, I mean, I get it. 
if your church has left God's truth, well, rip away. You know, you should leave because it's not really a church. If they're not preaching the gospel, that's not the church. Get out. But if you're at a church that does preach the gospel, appreciate it, love it, love the people. We're in this together. God has put us together for a reason. God has brought us all together as believers and he has told us that he's in gifted each one of us in different ways. So when we come together, we are able to serve the church, the local church. That's what God wants from all of us. If, you're in, if somebody's in a church that's not preaching the gospel, get out of it and get to a church that preaches the gospel, one that you can appreciate and love and participate in. Because that's God's plan for all of us. That's God's idea. It's what God wants. And then he says, also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And again, this firstborn from the dead, same thing, not firstborn in order. Jesus wasn't the first to die. There were people who died before Jesus. This is firstborn in preeminence in rank, in quality, if you will. First in everything. Verse 19 then continues, it says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And what he's talking about here is the fullness of God. It was God's pleasure that all the fullness of God would dwell in Jesus now, we, this is kind of, if you, um, we're used to this, but if you just, if you were brand new to Christianity, you knew a lot about God, the first thing you say, well, nothing can really contain God, right? God's omnipresent. God's everywhere at once. God's bigger than everything. God's spirit. I mean, how could that be? And even when Solomon built the temple, that God told David, then Solomon to build, and David collected everything for the building of it, and then Solomon completed the building of it. Even Solomon in the Old Testament got that. At the dedication of the temple, he prays in 1 Kings 8, 27, and it says this, behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house, which I have built, the temple is magnificent, you know, gold plated everything, you know, super amazing and all that stuff. But Solomon's going, how could you, God, dwell in a house like this? And we know from what happened that back then that God's presence did in some form come into the temple. That actually happened for a limited time. But that's a little different here you know, so in that sense, we say nothing can contain God. But here Paul's telling us that the fullness of God dwelt in him, meaning Jesus. God's presence was fully in Christ. So Jesus created the universe. Jesus created the church. And then third, Jesus created the only way for us to be reconciled to a righteous and holy God. Verse 20 continues here. It says, talking about Jesus, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. And, and when he says that to reconcile all things, this is a little tricky. Because now when people read that, that, okay, reconcile, make right with God all things. This leads to a teaching of universalism, but this is not universalism. How do we know it's not universalism? Because in order to interpret the Bible, the first thing we do is use scripture to interpret scripture. It's not universalism. Because the Bible doesn't teach, the Bible teaches there is no universalism. And so, but it doesn't mean that someday all non-Christians or demonic beings will somehow be with God in heaven and in right relationship. He's saying that because Jesus himself said that people who refused him would be forever separated in hell. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 25, uh, he says this in verse 46, 
talking about people who are, are not redeemed, these will go away into eternal punishment. By the way, how long does eternal punishment last? Yeah, eternally, forever. But the righteous into eternal life. By the way, how, eternal life, how long does that last? That's right. So reconcile all things to himself cannot mean universalism where everyone's saved. So the question is, what does it mean? What does that mean? Let's go back to that. What does that mean? Well, there's a few different ways of understanding it. Some people would say, well, reconcile all things is just referring, that's limited. It's not really all things. It's limited all things. And how it's limited is back to verse 18 where he's talking about the church or some people would say the new creation. So he, it's limited, reconcile all things, meaning all things within the new creation and within the church. Another way that Christians view this is, is that Paul would say, well, reconcile all things. What he's talking about it is that's only all things are only for people with whom reconciliation is possible, but it's not possible if you're rejecting Christ. So that's another way people take this. But there is a way to take this where reconcile all things actually means all things. And that's in the sense that all things, even unredeemed people and fallen angels will be reconciled to God in a sense for judgment, for separation, and become powerless. And so in that sense, we have peace throughout all creation because everything has been reconciled to Jesus in that sense, in that it's been the relationships. doesn't mean people are in right relationship. It means that people who have rejected Christ are now judged, separated, sent to hell, and have no more power as an enemy of God. And so now there is peace. And so that's another way of taking it with reconcile all things means actually all things. But it doesn't really matter. What we're saying here is that Christ is supreme. You know, that third view is a little bit about how Paul wrote to the Philippians. In Philippians 2, 9, he says this. For this reason also... God highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Then it continues. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Okay, well, every knee. So every knee as in every Christian knee or every knee, every knee. Every knee will bow. And then it explains that. Of those who are in heaven and on earth, so in heaven, that's redeemed people and angels. And on earth, that's people who are believers or non-believers. And under the earth, that's fallen angels and unredeemed people. Every knee will bow. All of them. And so that could be the sense of that reconciliation. Paul continues in Colossians 1 and verse 21 and says this, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. So again, he's talking back to us as believers, writing to Colossae saying, hey, we, and that was true of them, it's true of us too, we were enemies of Jesus. We start out enemies with God. We don't start out okay with God until we do something big that's wrong. We start out not in relationship with God, alienated, Hostile in mind, engaged in evil. That's us. And then he continues in verse 22. It says, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I think of a lot of things that, that Christians don't get I think this might be one of those biggest things that, that believers don't fully understand. We've been reconciled through Christ's death in order to present us before God holy, that's us holy, and blameless and beyond reproach. What does that holy, blameless, beyond, that spells joy. We have joy in knowing that we are presented. We have Christ's righteousness credited to our account. And 
if we remembered this better, it would keep us out of the cycle of guilt that sometimes Christians get caught up in. Because none of us can live a completely blameless life consistently. We, we don't do that. But God's calling us to do what? Well, to admit our sin, not reinterpret the Bible to, to make it where we haven't sinned. No, we admit our sin. We admit our guilt. People say, yeah, well, Christianity is full of guilt. No, people feel guilty when they do something they know is wrong. All people. Christianity has the answer for guilt. And this is it. Christ died to pay for our punishment. And so all of our sins are removed from us as far as the East is from the West. They don't stick to us anymore. Our old sins, past sins, present sins, even the future sins, if we are completely trusting in Christ, they are no longer held to our account. But we still know they're wrong. And so when we catch ourselves not walking in a manner worthy, like he called us to do last week, then we confess that we admit it, sin is sin. And then we repent of it, meaning we try to not do it again. We ask God for help to keep us from this sin, but we avoid the cycle of guilt by in that time after we've confessed and we've repented, then we don't live in the guilt anymore. We realize that God sees us as holy, blameless, beyond reproach, and we wear that and have joy in that. So that gets us, we don't feel guilty anymore. We've dealt with the guilt. Christ dealt with our guilt, and we move on to walk in a manner worthy of him. That's what we try to do. Does that make sense? And so that's how we have joy in Christ, even when we're fallible, even when we mess up, get over it, feel guilty. You should feel guilty, but then admit it, repent, and don't feel guilty anymore. It's removed from you. Move on. That's what we're told to do. That's what God wants for us. So, Above reproach, verse 23 continues. And the question that this will answer is, well, how do we really know that we're in, that we're considered by God to be holy and blameless and beyond reproach? Because then it starts off this way. And, and this is a huge, huge word, if, and that freaks people out. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. If, I think this continues, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Let's go back to the if. If indeed. Well, that makes it sound to people that, oh, well this sounds, oh, so if we don't continue, you're, this sounds like Paul's saying, I could lose my salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. We use the Bible for a scripture, interpret scripture. We know that that's not it. If you continue, it's just the test of your salvation. It's just showing your salvation. It's what's happening here. That's what he's telling us. It doesn't mean we can lose it. If you stop following in faith, it shows that you never had saving faith. God, the creator of the universe, through Jesus, who created us and died to save us, is strong enough to keep us in his hand. Continuance with the Christian life is a test of genuine faith. I don't mean you pass the test you're in... I mean, no, it just shows whether your faith is genuine or not. Jesus says in John 10, 28, he says, and I gave, and I give eternal life. Uh, I'm sorry, how, how long does, what's eternal? How long does eternal last? Well, what if I just had it for 20 years? Did I get eternal? No, Jesus says, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then a lot of you know this section, no one will snatch them out of God's hand, the Father's hand, and on it goes. Hey, when we're saved, we're always saved. 
And when we sin and stray against God, we admit it and we repent. And we drop the guilt because it's been taken care of, not because we're ignoring it. And we move on to walk in a manner worthy of Christ. That's what God wants from us. And when we think about the supremacy of Christ, that he's God, he's creator, that he created the universe, that's us. And that means he created you and he loves you. And he also created the church whom he died for. That's you if you're a believer. And he created the only way for us to be right with God. But it's not just right with God in the sense that our sins are paid for. That's half of it. They're removed. They're paid for. They're gone. They're covered forever. They no longer stick to our account if we've trusted in Christ. That's half of it. We, we get that half a lot of times as Christian, but we forget the other half. We've been given Christ's righteousness. We're holy in God's sight, blameless in God's sight. Hey, hey, Pastor, I'm not blameless. Yeah, in God's sight, you're blameless if you're in Christ because Christ was blameless. And you're above reproach right now, today. And that's what gives us the joy of the Christian life. That's what keeps us going through the ups, through the downs, through the obedience, and, and when we get derailed some, we keep coming back. He's our life. He's our joy. He's our forgiveness. He's done everything. He is everything. Let's stand together. We talked about the importance of having a relationship with Christ last time. And, and, and I think we had 11 people indicate that they became believers last Sunday. And we got to hear Mallory's testimony, which I know impacted a lot of people. And if you're still on the fence there, if you're still not sure, hey, we, we want to talk to you about that. And we're available in room one to answer any question that you have. But you have an opportunity today to, cr to trust, put your trust, your faith in Christ. And Christ alone, he loves you and he'll save you forever. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the joy that we have in following you. And Lord, we pray for everyone here that might not be a believer, that they would make the decision to put their trust in you, that you would draw them to yourself. And Father, for us as believers, that we would understand who we are, who you are first, and who we are in you. Because it'll bring joy to our life. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.